So the main enzymes we'll be talking about in ammonia assimilation are going to be glutamate dehydrogenase. Remember from when we talked about glutamate glutamate dehydrogenase earlier, we did oxidative deamination. Now we're going to do reductive amination because we're trying to put ammonia into some sort of molecule. The second one is going to be glutamine synthetase. So somehow we're going to be making glutamine, right, and using ATP because it's a synthetase. And then the third one is going to be carbamylophosphate synthetases 1 and 2. And they're very similar because they both make carbamylophosphate, but they're using a little bit different mechanisms, so we're going to talk about those. So recall that I said that glutamate dehydrogenase could go backwards, right, and, go, and do reductive amination. This is what we're seeing here. Because we're assimilating that ammonia into the alpha-ketoglutarate, we are going to be doing reductive amination. We're putting that amino group in the, in the alpha ketoglutarate and making glutamate and water. But we're going to do this with the use of NADPH instead of NAD+. And you can see here I wrote the oxidative deamination so you can compare it. And it's basically the same thing but flipped, flipped and we're using NAD+, in the oxidative deamination. Glutamate dehydrogenase in the reductive amination direction is not going to affect the NAD, NADH ratio because we're using NADPH, so it would make no sense if it did affect it. Our second enzyme we'll be talking about is going to be glutamine synthetase. So we're going to be making glutamine, and our synthetase here is, going to t is telling us that we're going to be using ATP to do that. So we're going to make glutamine, we know from glutamate. And because we're assimilating ammonia, we are going to add ammonia to glutamate. Because we're using that synthetase, we're going to use ATP. And we're going to be making glutamine. So if you can remember that it's a synthetase and that we're making glutamine, this reaction is going to be pretty simple to remember. So an important mechanism to note in glutamine synthetase is the, is the intermediate. So here we have glutamate. And once we add that ATP, we're going to put that phosphate group on the carboxylic acid. So here you can see it. Here's the carbonyl and here's our phosphate. And this is called glutamyl phosphate. So this allows us to attack the carbonyl and with the amino group and kick off the phosphate. And then we have this C double bond O to NH2 making glutamine. So it's important to note that there is a intermediate, and this is the name of the intermediate, glutamyl phosphate. So this is talking about carbamyl phosphate synthetases. The first one we're going to talk about is carbamyl phosphate synthetase 1, okay? And they act in similar ways, but carbamyl phosphate synthetase 1 is going to start with CO2 instead of glutamine, which is what uh, carbamyl phosphate synthetase 2 is going to start with. So, to the CO2, we're going to add one ATP, and here we see our phosphate group. And then we're going to have this NH3, or this ammonia group, attack the carbonyl and kick off that phosphate group. So then we're going to get our NH2 over here, and then our OH here. And for a second time, we're going to attack with a phosphate. So we're going to be using two ATPs in this reaction. I'm going to go over here. So this is our NH2, so we're going to come in over here and, and put a phosphate. And then we put it in another color. So here's our second phosphate. And this molecule is carbamoyl phosphate which is a powerful carbamylating agent. that You're going to see carbamyl phosphate in the urea cycle and also in purine and pyrimidine biosynthesis. But the urea cycle is going to use carbamyl phosphate synthesis 1. 
So you have to make the distinction between the two. And now we're going to go on and talk about carbonyl phosphate synthase 2. So carbonyl phosphate synthase 2 is going to use glutamine instead of ammonia as its amino group source. So what we see here is that glutamine is going to be covalently bound to the enzyme here, acting as a lid to prevent the ammonia from being protonated. And this ammonia group here is going to travel through the transfer tunnel, also preventing protonation. And the ammonia is going to attack the carbonyl and kick off that phosphate. And then we have part of the carbonyl phosphate made. Remember that we also have to, uh, to add ATP to put a phosphate on here so that it will be, become carbonyl phosphate. And so this is called the biosynthetic subunit. And I've made some of these points over here again to reiterate. The tunnel prevents protonation of the ammonia, like I said over here. Then we also use an impurine and pyrimidine biosynthesis. Remember that carbonyl phosphate synthase 2 is used in purine and pyrimidine biosynthesis, while carbonyl phosphate synthase 1 is used in the urea cycle, and it's in the mitochondria. And then lastly, glutamine acts as a lid preventing proton, proton entry. And we said this was because it was bound to the enzyme.